One of the newest residents of Detroit is actually a transplant from Northern California who came here via Miami and Budapest, and he now makes his office here at the Detroit Symphony Orchestra. Assistant conductor Teddy Abrams is just 26 years old, and he's wrapping up his first season with the DSO, but I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Like most prodigies, even though he's only in his 20s, Teddy's story actually starts decades ago. I also do a lot of like improv, just straight up improv. Oh, sure. That's completely okay. my own. Cool. What do you want well, me to do? Well, uh, if if it was, uh, I guess it does need I, it does need a suggestion. Um, maybe some improv. kind of suggestion. Um, the thing is, Teddy Abrams doesn't really need a suggestion. When music is your life, it tends to knock around in your head, just waiting to pour out. Teddy is a composer. He plays clarinet and piano with his group Sixth Floor Trio. But it was conducting that captured the imagination of a young boy who already showed immense musical talent. I decided when I was nine that I, I wanted to be a conductor, actually. It was after my first concert that I saw. I've told a lot of people in, in Detroit the story, but when I was in San Francisco, I went to a free outdoor concert of all Gershwin played by the San Francisco Symphony. And as soon as I saw that performance, I mean, right then and there, probably after the first couple notes, I decided I wanted to be a conductor. That had to be my life. Full value quarter, full value quarter. Age nine may sound young to start down a career path, but Teddy's musical aptitude and appetite actually began much earlier. When I started playing uh, piano, I was just drawn to the instrument at age three. Staccato G's. I, I like to go over to the piano and, and with no training, just kind of improvise and make up stuff. I'm sure it sounded dreadful, um, but the fact is I was attracted to the instrument itself. By third grade, Teddy gravitated toward another instrument. I wanted to play the saxophone. I was all set and ready to go with saxophone, except it turned out that my hands were too small for the saxophone, so clarinet it was. Saxophone was cool back then. That was the Bill Clinton saxophone era, so everyone wanted to play that. <laughs> that was the cool instrument. Um, and, but I was a smaller kid, still a smaller guy, but a smaller kid then. And clarinet, though, just had some kind of hold over me. And while other kids were still struggling to make horrendous squeaks out of their instruments after the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth week of playing, for whatever reason, uh, I, don't, I don't really have an explanation for it other than it just was something that, that clicked. I was able to be playing through pieces quite quickly. He skipped high school and went to music conservatory, an accelerated childhood not unfamiliar to the musically gifted. There's actually this lovely Mozart piece that, that I, I always use as an example. It's a piece he wrote when he was five years old. And it's perfectly happy, lovely music, except there's one chord that's just it's just so touching and moving and, and sad, and the music stops right there. That as a five-year-old, to have this sensibility, this, this ability to reach out emotionally beyond what he should know, that's the kind of musical talent that, that you could assign the word prodigy to. Perfectly nice. And here, mm -hmm. who would come up with that as a five-year-old? And then it just ends perfectly happily. It's so funny that you're willing to move past the fact that he wrote the rest at age five, because for most of us, <laughs> that is already, uh, you know, that's an astonishing accomplishment to begin with. It, it is, it is, but... But you're right, the nuance of, the, of a minor key that just sort of comes out of nowhere in there is, is exactly. astonishing. It's, it's an amazing move to make. I'm going to guess Detroit was not on your radar when you started your path. The city itself was not exactly a place that I would have seen myself if you'd asked me a couple of years ago, where am I going to end up living? What is my life going to look like? It just was not on the radar. But the Detroit Symphony was definitely on the radar, and Teddy is now at home in the city, a short walk away from work. Proximity is essential because Teddy doesn't drive. Funny thing that I noticed is that everybody I met that lives here, that has made Detroit their home, really likes it. Yeah. I didn't see all these hordes of people trying to leave. You are the uh, the kind of person that Detroit has been wanting to attract to, de you know, the, the, the creative class, your age, um, your cultural ambition and outlook. You've been here now about half a year, though. Mm -hmm. uh, do you feel like you're a part of this sort of movement that's occurring in Midtown, not just at the orchestra hall, but living here? Absolutely. When I first got this job here, 
I obviously had a lot of questions. You know, what's the state of the orchestra? What's the financial state of the orchestra? What's the city going to be like? I remember I was mulling over the, the situation and I got a phone call from a, a good friend of mine and he said, I heard you got this position. This is incredible because Detroit is maybe the most exciting city in the United States right now. When I thought about it and took a step back and looked at what was really happening here, I could not agree more. And I love bringing friends here, bringing other artists out here from different cities and showing them around because they're, they're always as amazed as, as I am as to both the, the kind of like stupefyingly strange stuff that you might see here and, and the frightening things and then the amazing development that's happening. And that's the time you want to be in a place. You do actually have a chance to come in here and, and create a shadow. And in yes. New York, well, good luck with that. We're, I mean. we're building this city not from a cultural level. Probably many people are doing it on a structural level. But, yeah, yeah. but uh, from my perspective, we have the opportunity to actually create uh, uh, the new Detroit culture, to bind it together. And, yeah. and anything seems possible, which is, I mean, that's very attractive for an artist. It's very, and it's very hard to find. It's very hard I to mean, find you just can't, established American you know, city. Yeah, that's right. You can't. Part of his mission is to bring new musical experiences to younger, wider audiences. This particular program is one that we've actually done a number of times. I think six times, maybe seven times already. So it's, it's quite familiar to us. I think that people are scared to come to the concert hall if they don't come regularly. Everybody has the right to feel however they want about every single piece of music that we play. First of all, just because we play it doesn't mean that A, it's necessarily good objectively or that they have to love it. Everybody has the right to make decisions for themselves about what the music means. Do you know those people playing? I am one of them. You are one of them? Yes. Oh, okay. One of them is me. How about you? Yes. Are I you play and conduct. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's very hard. I always say that conducting is not like train conducting. It's not starting and stopping the train and telling people when to get on and off. But it's also not like being some kind of overlord of the orchestra. You're not the dictator in chief of the orchestra at all. My view of conducting is that it's actually like conducting energy. And if you could see the light spectrum of energy that moves in an orchestra, you'd see this web, like a spider web almost, of, of energy that goes between every single uh, person who's in that orchestra. And you'd see it light up. And as a conductor, my role is to focus that. My role is to make sure that that energy flows in the best way possible. You're trying to use your ears to take in as much sound as possible. You're trying to delineate the sounds of a hundred musicians all at the same time and compare that to all the knowledge that you've stored inside your brain about the music, about the background of the music, about the backgrounds of the individuals and this I mean, ridiculous amount of data. And so what happens is your brain suddenly goes into overdrive. It's easy to conduct. Anybody can do it. What's hard is to lead. Anybody can beat time, but not anybody can actually unify musicians that they can play their absolute best. Clearly wise well beyond his years, Teddy gets to conduct his first subscription concert for the DSO this fall. Now, not driving may be an anomaly around these parts, but believe it or not, cab culture is starting to grow in Detroit. Our Will Jones recently spent time with Onita the cab driver, one of the most fascinating women around with opinions on just about everything. She used to share them in the newspaper. Well, now you'll have to hail her taxi to get her take on life, and that's next on First Block.